Well, hello everyone and welcome on board the Sunrise Safari. My name is Scott, if some of you haven't met me before, and I'm teamed up with jean -Dre on camera today. We're still having problems with our second vehicle, so you won't be see on board another vehicle at any point, but what is exciting is that James and Brent and Jamie, and I think also VM are all heading out with the backpack that's used for transmitting the bushwalks. And they're gonna play around with that and try and get you some interesting views of a lot of the smaller critters that are starting to move around after we got our first decent rains this year. It came a bit early and it's really brought the bush to life. So really loving the effect that the rain has already had. And you can hear the birds this morning, Cape turtle doves, Franklins, just to name a few, all calling and wide awake and it is a beautiful crisp cool and clear morning here in the Sabi sands the bush has been completely cleaned of all the dry and dusty conditions and i'm certainly looking forward to getting out there with you if you haven't joined in for a safari for quite some time you'll notice some pretty drastic changes a lot of latent uh, water holes or puddles are now filled with water so there are big changes that have happened over the last few days and you are really going to enjoy the changes of scenery We've got Nikki and Tara in the final control room and I'm not going to waste too much time and I'm actually going to get going and see what else we can find. Not too many reports from last night, although one very interesting one and it's come through from Lynn and Morning Glory. Thank you very much for sending through those reports, they help us greatly. And basically what Lynn and Morning Glory heard on the Juma waterhole camera, which is a live camera 24 hours a day, is some animals in distress this morning, possibly impala. VM thought he heard bushbuck at a very similar time, and that was about an hour or so ago, just over an hour ago. So James and Brent and Jamie and VM are all going to head into that area with the walking backpack and snoop around. They're never gonna go too far from the vehicle, and they are unarmed, so they are gonna be a little bit limited in what experience they give you as they don't have a rifle on them. But that's nothing too serious. Oh, wow, look at this. Perfect timing. We're not probably going to go anywhere for just the next few seconds. Beautiful. And listen to all the birds. It's incredible how the bush has come alive. We've started seeing a lot of insects moving ar ar along. And we'll continue to see more insects as well as reptiles. And who knows, maybe we'll get lucky and see some tortoise today who've been lying dormant waiting for the summer conditions. Maybe a snake. We've seen one snake so far and I was very surprised when we saw that. And on a crisp, cool morning like this, it's 11 degrees Celsius, 52 degrees Fahrenheit. You may find a lot of the reptiles basking themselves in the sunshine. It's a tricky thing finding a lot of these animals because they're so well camouflaged, but they will be out. And that flaming ball of gas that we can see rising off to the east is going to hopefully lure them out of their hiding places. Well, if this is your first live safari, welcome. And just to let you know, we would love to hear your thoughts and comments and questions. And it's very easy to do so. You can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And that way we can try our best to tailor make the safari experience to all of your needs. So I'm not too sure exactly where to head this morning. There's not too much intelligence other than the alarm calls of distress somewhere around the Juma waterhole. But like I said, I think we should leave that to James and the rest of the crew that he's going to be operating with this morning. And they can snoop around there. I don't want to drive through that area at the moment. So the roads have become very, very hard. And therefore, basically, our newspaper has become a lot more difficult to read since the rain. And as much as rain can soften sand and roads, which allows animals to leave depressions or their tracks for us to follow, 
there are certain roads after the rain that actually solidify and harden almost like cement and that's the case for the majority of the roads and it's something that we've probably taken for granted during the winter months when the roads are dry and dusty making it very easy to not only see tracks of animals on the road but even if they disappear off the road on little game trails then we can follow them a lot easier and I always wonder to myself how exactly do we manage to find the animals in summer it's going to become incredibly thick probably about we'll probably be able to see about a quarter as far into the bush as we can at the moment yet we still manage to find a lot of animals and I think it's because they're probably more inclined to use the roads rather than move through the very thick bush and that's why I think we can still get away with the very thick conditions and still manage to find you guys some animals but we don't have to worry about that just yet because I think we've got about a month or so before it starts to really thicken up and that's only if we get some more rain Some more interesting updates have just come through from Lisa and Teresa. Thank you very much for sending these updates through. And basically it sounds like there was lion, leopard and hyena audio coming from somewhere around the Arethusa waterhole. Now earlier I was just discussing how the bush is still very thin and it has an effect on how far we can see. But it also has a massive, massive impact on how far we can hear and sound at the moment travels very clearly over large distances because there's not a lot of foliage which would naturally absorb the sound which we'll be experiencing in the summer months and what that means is that the noise and audio that you could have been hearing could have been a fair distance away from the waterhole camera but we may certainly head across onto Arethusa but later my plan is to initially work the Juma property and then possibly head across there. What makes it tricky is that our radio comms at the moment aren't the best with Arethusa, so there's no way for me to actually contact the guys now and ask them for an update. I literally have to drive there and be fairly close to them. So it's not as easy as I would like it to be, or you may think it would be, to just get on the radio and ask them what's going on. But we may head across there a little bit later. Earlier I was mentioning how we can expect a lot of reptiles to start moving around in the warmer, wetter months of the year and hopefully that may start today and Georgian in Illinois was obviously tuned into yesterday's sunrise safari and she remembers seeing a little lizard or skink and would like to know if I managed to find out what it was and Georgian, I was completely wrong. It was not a skink. It does look very similar to a small skink that we do get here. But it was actually a Moreau's house gecko. And we can thank Brent for correctly identifying that animal for us. Okay, good news. Just want to see if we can position the vehicle accordingly. There's one little section of the road here where it is going to be a lot easier for us to see tracks. And look at all these leopard tracks. Awesome. 
Well, this to me looks like a female leopard and judging by the area that we are in, it could well be Shadow. Failing that, it could be Karula, Shadow's mother. And this is a buffering point of their territories. Their territories kind of overlap here and I've seen both leopards here fairly recently. So, we obviously are going to continue doing our best not to follow these tracks and see where they may lead us. Just let me get on the radio quickly and update Aubrey and Craig what's going on, what my plans are, as they are also out searching for game. Morning Aubrey, uh, I'm Konza for Mafazi Ingwe heading west on Balanatis at uh, Zoe's Always. Okay, copy. I've just found the tracks now, so I'm not sure what she does from this junction. Whether she goes south or continues east. So, now we've encountered the problem that most of the roads have got at the moment and that is that they have solidified quite a lot. So, that little patch we saw back there was easy to see tracks in, but there's been no clear sign of where this leopard may have gone. So, I'm just going to have to jump out quickly and see if I can take a closer look and work out where she went at this junction of roads. Well, it doesn't look like she's come this way, so I'm going to try this side now. can't see anything this side either and I mean if you look where I'm walking and even jumping it's very difficult to leave a depression that's with me jumping I mean you can see a very slight mark that my boots have left but that's really trying my best to leave a depression so you can understand how a leopard who probably weighs about 30 kilograms less than me is not going to leave nearly as big of a depression. I just want to check one more road, which is up on the other side of the vehicle. We had a four-way intersection here. Well, just like that, after having seen the tracks only a few meters away, I've got no idea where this leopard has gone. And what we're then going to do is just head off, keep working this general area rather than trying to follow each footprint, but certainly keep in mind that we did have these tracks here. I guess it emphasizes just how tricky it is to see tracks at this time of the year. Before the rains came, this would have been one of the easiest road junctions to see tracks and it's usually very dusty when it was in the winter months. But not now. I can't wait 
workout where this Mafazi Ingwe has gone, but about 40 meters to the west of Balanati, Zoe's Junction, and tracks we're heading east along Balanati's. Good news. I've just seen one track down here, so this is the way the leopard came. So we got lucky. My gut feel led me in the right direction. Last station, I'm not copying it clearly. I've just found some more tracks that are heading south from Balanati's down Rebecca's. Apologies, I've, as you can see, been concentrating on the radio and I just want to stop here. There's a family of long-tailed shrikes that are really singing out their chorus and it's a sound that we haven't heard for too long but we will now begin to hear on a daily basis and it's a wonderful call. And while we listen to these birds calling, we've got a few more updates through, I think, from Lynn and Steve. And they say there was a lot of leopard calling for about an hour last night around the Arethusa waterhole. Maybe Sandile trying to... Or sorry, Deborah and Steve, maybe it was... Shadow trying to get a hold of Madiba, also formerly known as Sandile. So we're all getting a bit confused as to the name change now and forgetting that. So that may happen once or twice more. Or who knows, maybe it's the Anderson male in Tingana letting everybody know they're around. Apologies everyone for all the bare chestedness you got to see this morning when James helped me attach my earpiece this morning I forgot to do my buttons back up. So it wasn't the vibe I was going for. <laughs> but as summer comes we are all going to want to start taking our clothes off on drive even though we won't. It is going to become very very hot and humid. Beautiful, thanks, Chandra. Okay, so the tracks of this leopard were veering down in this direction. I'm not going to try and follow each individual footprints, but just continue working the area with the knowledge that there is or has been a leopard moving through this general area. And judging by the crispness of these tracks, I think. They are from last night, so certainly worth following up on. said I'm not going to try and follow each individual track I'm still going to keep a close eye on the road because the more information we can gather on this leopard's movements the more likely we are of finding it no further tracks going down here even though this was the last direction it was moving in it's going to be interesting to see 
where the lions start popping out because all of the guides have had some trouble establishing where they've actually moved to after the rains and nobody's been having any lion sightings even around us not nobody but the Inkuhuma pride is unaccounted for we're not too sure where all the Birmingham boys are the Matimba males last I heard were south of the Sand River so quite far from here and it appears like the Birmingham boys may have left a powerful impression on them and that's why they've decided to steer clear of these marauding young males I don't think it's over though I think there's certainly going to be a few more conversations or confrontations between the two Matimbas and the five Birminghams and not only them when there is a takeover there will be a lot of shifts in dynamics between not only this coalition but other coalitions of males that move through this area and as a lot of the lioness prides also get displaced we can naturally expect to see a few changes and maybe we'll get to see a new pride in the coming weeks and months anyway the reason why the guys haven't been able to find these lions is simply because of the ground being so hard now and a lot of the evidence of where the lions may have moved would have been washed away by the constant rain so we basically could get very pleasantly surprised and around any one of these corners we could come across a whole pride of lion or a leopard or any animal for that matter and that's what I love about these live safaris we really never know what's going to happen Just like last night, we went out on a night drive after dinner and we were stopped at the Buffalo Cut Cutline with Gauri Cutline, so kind of the central but northern parts of Juma. Oh, my earpiece is pu pu pulled out. And we were stopping, looking at the stars, listening, and all of a sudden, Nikki picked up the spotlights as she heard a small rustle in the grass and there was a male leopard walking right past us in front of the vehicle. So her hearing was better than any of the others on the vehicle. Mine's terrible. And sadly the leopard appeared to be like quite a nervous young male. So we couldn't get an idea on it. He was just a little bit too far from the vehicle, slinking away from us. But it looked to me like a three to four year old male leopard. And that was a very pleasant surprise last night. Sadly, he headed straight north into Buffalsook, so we couldn't follow him. But it actually reminds me that I should get a hold of Aubrey quickly and let him know about that sighting last night, even though it was long ago. If he comes across tracks in that area later on this morning, he'll be able to at least know that they're not very fresh, they're from early last night. Aubrey, just to let you know, there was a young skittish, my daughter Ingwe, maybe three or four years old, I don't know, we didn't get a good look, but he wasn't Makulu. And he was on Gauri Cutline, Buffalo Cutline at about 9 o'clock last night and headed straight north up to Sala Plum. This earpiece may be broken as it is plugged in and I'm not sharing anything. All right, there we go. It seems to have rectified itself.
been speaking a lot about lions and how they may and will be encountering one another and the action that may unfold as the Birmingham boys come in through this area. And still on the topic of confrontations, but just a different cat, Safari Hayes is interested to know, what will leopards do, especially female leopards do when they confront one another? Will they rasp that loud call? And yes, they certainly will. It's basically the leopard's language, be it male or female. They will all communicate through that same loud rasping, be it male or female. And it's no different really to lions, who both the males and females will let off a very similar sounding audio. Very experienced people in the bush who've got great cheering may be able to distinguish between the calls of a male and the calls of a lioness. But it isn't easy and the same goes for leopard so they'll both certainly let out their roars and calls and what's also important to remember safari Hayes, is that the males will compete with the males and the females will compete with the males so the females so there'll be a lot of conversations had between groups of females with other females i.e the prides of lion and the same goes for the coalitions of males they'll also communicate a lot with one another and it's also applicable to leopard. Female leopard will fight with one another to acquire territories. They're usually quite small in comparison to the territory of a male. And you'll often find, depending on how uh, successful any individual male is, he may well have four or five females within his territory. But he obviously doesn't mind being there because They'll provide food for him when he stumbles upon them on kills and he'll also be able to mate with them when the times are right. But the disputes that they have between one another, he doesn't get involved in, so... Hopefully it won't be long before we do see some disputes between any leopards, be it male on male or female on female. It's something that we haven't managed to show you in all the months that we've been here, although we did have one sighting with Tingana and Mvula. They were in the same sighting, but they weren't really getting up too much when we were there. My earpiece is causing trouble, guys, so I'm going to have to drive around and hold it in, which isn't sustainable, but unless I'm pushing it in, I cannot share anything with the outer world. Just have a quick look at what the problem could be here. Our life would be a lot easier if we didn't have these earpieces, but I guess they're a critical part of the operation. We just need to try and find the right ones. play around with this you guys can enjoy the beautiful tour of the scenery that John is taking you along. Okay well thankfully there is another earpiece in this vehicle so I'm just gonna plug that one in and it seems to be working better than the initial one that I had. Sadly, I'm not going to have the opportunity to get James to plug it into the back of my shirt, so it's just going to be dangling freely. And we'll see how long that lasts. It's incredible how it's heating up so quickly. And it was 11 degrees Celsius earlier, I'm sure it's probably already closer to about 15 or 16. Okay, well, it 
apologies for that slight delay. But we are back and running. Thanks so much to everyone who keeps sending through reports. Now we've got one through from Linda B. Saying that she heard leopards calling around the Juma waterhole last night. And like I said earlier, Brent and his team are heading out into that area to follow up. So don't worry, they are searching that area and they a far more effective unit to go in there because they can stop and listen and walk around. Whereas we don't have that ability otherwise you guys are going to get left behind so it'll be best for us to allow them to focus on that task which they are doing and hopefully they're going to come up with something for us to drive through that area we may ruin good evidence of tracks on the road and we're not going to be able to stop there and listen and walk around like i say otherwise you won't be able to come along with so that's not going to be too much fun if we do go there. It is remarkable how much these water holes have filled up. Incredible. Just a few days ago, the catfish and tilapia that live in these ponds were clearly visible as they all squirmed around in very small puddles. And we can still see a few rises of the fish moving, but not nearly as confined as they were before the rain. And we've got somewhere between 20 and 30 millimeters of rain, according to the various reports we got from guys at the surrounding camps, so a very large downpour. Look at that beautiful reflection there. Oh, and the fish. It appears to be rising up in a very similar spot each time. There's an African pied wagtail that you can see running along the edge of the water there. You can also hear it calling. Beautiful. These wagtails are specialized in feeding on aquatic animals, mainly invertebrates. So we often see them on the river courses or along the edges of water holes like this. Look at how fast it is. And every now and then you'll see why it gets its name. The wagtail because it excitedly wags its tail. What a beautiful crisp morning it is here. Wonderful. Well, we've just got a question through from Chris and he's interested to know how and when will we start to see the snakes that I was speaking of earlier and will there be some cobras amongst them? And it's difficult business finding them, Chris. They often slink off or slither off before we can see them. But a good way of finding snakes at this time of year is with birds. 
birds alarm calling in bushes as a group, so a mob of birds, a bird party, come into an area and let off an absolute racket, trying to let everyone know that there is some danger in the area. So birds and bird parties are often one of the best ways to find snakes. The tricky thing is even if they are alarm calling, the snake could be so well camouflaged that we can't find the thing. But there is a strong chance that birds are going to lead us to snakes. A herd of Inyale actually led us to a python last year, all staring intently into the grass. And we were almost certain there was a snake there, but weren't exactly sure what it was. And on closer inspection, we found a python curled up in the grass. Um, cobras, we will get to see. The main cobra that we get in this area is the Mozambican spitting cobra. And they're not the biggest of cobras, probably about a meter and a half to 1.8 meters in at their biggest size and about this thick. But hopefully we will get to see some cobras. And I remember last year, we found a tiny little cobra in the middle of the road and actually got it to flare its hood up. So some of you will remember seeing that. And we have already seen one snake so far this season, and it was a brown house snake. So there's a multitude of different species. Uh, some are very ve highly venomous, others are constrictors, so not venomous at all. So we will be doing our best to find them, but I know last summer we didn't see that many snakes. And it's something that always frustrates me. You often see their tracks crossing the roads, but seldom actually find them. the topic of reptiles, Pretty Nightman Maggie have said, will we see any snakes in the water or are there any crocs in that water hole? And occasionally you will see snakes moving in the water, but, and there are some water snakes that you do get in this area, but typically it's not something you commonly see although almost all snakes are very good swimmers so if you were to throw a snake into that water hole it would survive and be able to swim to the side very easily crocodiles yes could certainly start moving from the bigger water sources to the smaller ones but the only water hole on juma where we have seen a crocodile in my time here is at the buffles of water hole which is quite far from here but even though it's far, it's important to know that crocodiles can move very large distances over land from one water point to another. And we'll find a lot of the crocodiles that would have gone down into the sand river or to the very big water holes that still had sufficient water in over the dry winter months will begin to move. And I've seen crocodiles kind of staying over at a and b you could say, or a little hotel stop in tiny little mud wallows and they'll just use A to B but the important thing to remember is never assume that there is not a crocodile in any of the water holes simply because you haven't seen one there because then you may fall into a very nasty trap and think it's a great down by going for a swim and then ending up in the jaws of a crocodile. And they are one of the predators that I respect most in this ecosystem. And they are one of the seek out and hunt humans. The instinctual fear of us is not as deeply ingrained as it is in a lot of the other animals. And they know full well that they can overpower us and feed on us so you've got to be careful of them Aubrey's just trying to get a hold of me on the radio so I want to see what news he has for us maybe it's some good good info go ahead Orbs Well, 
done, my friend. Thank you very much. I'm just on Tree House Weaver's Nest. See you now. Well, it was good news. And as you can see, we've done a very sharp turn and we are heading back in the direction we came in. And we are off to see one of the stars of our show who has been great quality viewing over the last few months but we'll wait until we get there to see exactly who it is and i've got some great news and while you sit in suspense scratching your head wondering where we off to we're gonna send you off to James and his crew who are ready to they found on the bushwalk it's not an official bushwalk but they do have the ability to move around and film on foot I'm sure they're not going to be far from the vehicle so you don't have to worry about their health or safety they are in complete control and we are going to continue on to where Aubrey has called us to and we'll let you know as soon as we get there Live. Hello everybody, here we are in the wilderness, two of us together and you can see mercifully I, James Hendry, am not operating the camera. Now this for those of you who have a predisposition to seasickness is an excellent plan. On camera today we have Viam and Viam is roughly, uh, is trussed up with about 37 different wires and um, Yes, he looks a little bit like a, a sort of wire gentleman that somebody finds on the side of the road being built by a refugee. And fortunately, having Vim and all his technical ability, they are both mic'd up, so hopefully you'll be able to hear us a bit better than you did on yesterday's sunset safari. That may be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your position. Now, you're not going to be with us for long. We're just giving you a quick update of what we're doing for the morning. We are out here trying to find some tracks of lions that we heard knocking about here during the course of the evening yesterday. Uh, we haven't found any yet, but there is a magnificent smell of crispness and wonderful moisture in the air from the wonderful rains we had the other day. Yes, I'm still missing the dry. Uh, it would have made the lion tracks a lot easier to see, but hopefully we will be able to find some tracks. And I know a lot of you heard a leopard sawing on the Juma can uh, through the night. Uh, I also heard that and we have checked in that area. Unfortunately, we weren't able to fi find any tracks, but guys, keep listening to the Juma cam. If you hear any alarm calls, let us know and we'll race right back. And we do love to hear from you, so please remember hashtag Safari Live if you're tweeting like a white browed scrubbed robin or um, send us an email, questions at wildearth.tv. Uh, our plan at the moment is to head gently down the Biffles Hook cut line towards Biffles Hook water hole and see if we can't find some evidence of those large cats that we heard last night. But we will see what happens as we go. We're still figuring this uh, kind of mobile unit out. Uh, don't know how far away from VM we can go. Um, and we will be obviously not on a specific walking or tracking experience, so we will be in the vehicle for most of the time. So don't worry if you see us without a rifle. Um, we have the vehicle just behind the camera so we are going to be moving a little bit to and from the vehicle but we're not going to be going too far and the reason we're not going to be going too far and doing a full walking safari is because we don't have a rifle mm. and the reason we walk without a rifle sometimes when we're tracking it's because we do not have Viam who has half of Africa attached to his back so if we had to get into a difficult situation it would be difficult for the cameraman to move Right, now, um, instead of us waffling at you, uh, while we figure out a couple of these things, uh, Scott, I believe, has something fairly surprising. Now, we're going to head back across to him, and we will hopefully see you with something slightly more exciting than our ugly mugs the next time you see us. Enjoy what Scott has to show you, and we'll see you a little bit later. Adieu. A minutes away, not even, so don't go anywhere until we reveal the surprise to you. Woo! It's incredible how much colder it gets when you increase 
increase the speed and the wind chill factors. Having its effect on us here. I'm going to slow down because just up ahead of us was where the surprise was initially found. And Concentrate now and work out where our best spot will be to go. Okay, so I can see Aubrey, he's just up ahead. I'm hoping it's not going to be long until we get your view. Does it look like he's crossed your orbs? He's got some spider webs in my mouth. According to Aubrey, he, he was heading more north, so I'm giving you a clue there as to it's not a lot of animals, it's just one animal and it's a male. Okay. Just, I think we're going to be able to maybe get a glimpse here somewhere. Chandra just had to pull the antenna back up as that popped down. But take a closer look to our left. Surprise! Awesome! It's Madiba. A young male leopard. And we could well have been tracking his mother earlier this morning. It looks like he's listening very intently. No, he's back on the move now. But he does seem very focused. And maybe he's heard something up ahead of us in this thick bush. He is heading into a tricky area, so this may be the last glimpse we have of, it, of him. At least for now, and we'll try and have to relocate him on the other side of this little riverbed he's heading into. He is very poised though, there must be something up ahead there that's caught his attention. Obviously it's not too close though, and that's what's allowing him to move forward fairly quickly, but I'm fairly certain he is on the trail of something up ahead there. Hmm. Aubrey, thanks very much. Look at that camouflage. Beautiful. I love watching them move through this thick vegetation. Obviously some nice clear close-ups are also great, but to see them slinking through this, imagine how terrifying it must be for the prey animals seeing a sight like that approaching them. Oof. Not an easy job for Jandre on camera, but he's doing a great job keeping focus on him as he melts into this Tamboiti thicket. A 
Okay, I'm just going to get on the radio again and let Aubrey and Texan know. Texan arrived just a moment after me, but it was too late to get a view of the leopard from here. So I'm just going to let them know where we had the last visual from. And they're going to loop it around to the northern side of this riverbed and try and relocate them there. And rather than us rushing around like them, it will be best for us to try and stay with them from this side so that they can relocate. Look at this little forktail dronger that came down to catch an insect that we chased up. Aubrey he has continued north uh, down into this drainage from where I was last parked. and we've managed to find him again. You can't see too much other than a few spots. But at least we've still got a glimpse of him and a lot of you have sent through comments saying, look at how big he is and he is growing. Some of you mentioned that you got confused and thought it could have been Tingana. But I can assure you, if they were side by side, Tingana would be considerably larger than him. But he is certainly taking the shape of a male leopard now. And I look forward to hopefully spending at least the next six months following his growth. He could hang around for even longer than that. And he's listening very intently here. And I'm just going to get back onto the radio to let the guys know that I do still have a visual. Orbs, I still do have a visual of him. He's just south of this Skorva and stationary for now, but still looking to move north. Um, Texan, it's it's difficult. I don't. Th I mean, I've got a view here, but if he goes any further, there's a big Tumbuti thicket ahead of me. So I think the best bet would probably to be waiting on the northern side of this drainage, and I'll I'll stand by on the southern side and try and link him up to you. Look at his ears twitching from side to side. He must hear something or sense something up ahead. I wonder what it could be. A young leopard of this size will attack a wide variety of prey in terms of size. And anything from as small as a little dwarf mongoose up to possibly impala sized prey now we've never seen him with a large kill the largest kill we've seen him with it's a toss up between a franklin and a dwarf mongoose <clears throat> but that's not to say he hasn't had success catching bigger prey and like a lot of you said it's he's growing into a bigger male now and he's bigger than his mother so certainly capable in terms of size 
of taking an adult impala. Watch closely because he could leap or pounce at any moment. I think he could be chuffing. If you can see his mouth moving ever so slightly, it's another form of leopard communication. Like I said, it's called chuffing. And it's basically short exhalations kind of thing. And he may be doing that out of frustration or excitement in this hunt, but I saw some very slight chuffing-like movements coming from his muzzle. And while we sit and wait to see what he does next, we can chat. Uh, oh! There he goes. He went for something. I don't think he succeeded. You got him there, bottom left, John Ray? Maybe a small rodent. I did see a little gerbil moving about earlier. It was too quick to get Jandre onto it. But possibly a small rodent, a small bushveld gerbil. I think he might be close to it because he's still fishing around in that area. Oh, oh. oh right. I think he's under the vehicle. I think he went straight under the vehicle. You can see the branches moving in front of us. He's right in front of us. So we can't move, he's too close to us, but he literally ran straight towards the vehicle. And whatever he was chasing, who knows, maybe he caught it. I'm just gonna try and poke my head up. Just in front of us. He hasn't caught anything though. Tex, I've got your audio. If you want to switch off there and just get an idea of where I am. He's just uh, lanzering some gundans here. So there's nothing we can do. He's too close to, to start the vehicle. But whatever he chased, I think ran straight underneath the car. And I thought he followed suit, but there was a big log, actually, that the animal may have hidden under. You can maybe see a bit of a corner of the log sticking out, and not very clearly, but you can see the twig in front of the bonnet moving. And I said Lanzering Ngundan, which means he's hunting rats in... Well, half of it's Shangan and half of it is Zulu. So, not perfect language, but Texan will know what I'm saying. There he goes. Oh, he did get it. Look, it's in its mouth. Oh, you can't see its mouth. He caught the rat. Awesome! Look at that! You can only just see it. Well done, Madiba. Not the biggest prey, but it's your first kind of live kill. Awesome! Well done! How cool! Well, when I peeked my head over the bonnet, I didn't see anything over his mu in his mouth, but he may have had it in its paws.
taxi is just caught uh, Gundanya. Wow. Hey, it's so thick here, but he is moving around, um, so he may continue towards you. Absolutely awesome. Yeah, affirmative. He's just uh, ahead of my vehicle and slightly to the west, maybe 10 meters. I don't think we can get you a better view than what we've got now. It's incredibly thick here and I think this is the end of the road for us. Like I said, there's a massive log just ahead of us. And this is great to see because it's, I think, a common misconception that these predators only catch large prey. or oh, it looks like he's playing with it. But I've even seen adult leopards eat tiny birds out of a nest, tiny little chicks. And any meal that they can make or catch will keep them going. And a lot of small meals like this can help sustain leopards between the bigger meals. I didn't get a very close look at his prey, but I think it could very well be a bushveld gerbil. Which is a rat-like animal, it's a small rodent. They live in small burrows under the ground. And we've just got a question coming through, ask if we get any cane rats. And there certainly are cane rats within the Sabi Sands, but they typically like to follow the river courses or large river beds which we don't have too many of that's not to say they're not going to be around but i've never seen one here at juma and a cane rat for those of you who don't know is a very large rat probably the size of a guinea pig, which is something that a lot of you will be able to maybe relate to. And it even looks fairly similar to a guinea pig. I want to see if there's no chance we can get a little bit closer. It will be great to see him playing about here. Oh, sorry. tricky in here but this may be a better angle for the time being <coughs> and he's still playing around with his kill he hasn't finished it off yet no just different to domestic house cats who will often play around with their quarry before killing it and I did see him chase after it again shortly and he's almost urging it on to move again so I can relive the takedown. So Lisa, you are 100% correct. This is the first live kill that we've seen him make and I'm hoping we're going to get to see him make many more. We didn't get to see the actual takedown. It all happened so quickly. Oh. And again, he's chased it straight up to our vehicle. I'm just going to reverse ever so slightly. Very tricky. 
lucky here, but you will get a view of them there. And this poor little gerbil is not having the best morning. There's a rattling cysticular alarm calling now. I wonder if he's lost it. And like I said, he is chasing it around. He's playing with it like a domestic house cat. He has not killed it yet. And has he lost it or does he still have it between his paws? I'm not too sure. He did move quite a large distance chasing it this most recent time. And he may well have lost it. It looks not looking very promising now. But let's give it a moment or two. Maybe it is between his paws. Now a tree squirrel's alarm calling. Cindelia, have you just let breakfast disappear? I think what could be happening is a poor rodent might just be under a few fallen down branches and logs. Well, yeah, it's still there. It's, he's just urging it to move again. He's just playing with this gundan, running up and down, chasing it, letting it, yeah, he hasn't killed it yet. He's right in front of my vehicle, maybe five meters away. It's still there. So, he didn't lose breakfast and it looks like, oh no, not quite ready for breakfast just yet. It's not easy, we're in such thick bush here that we can't position the vehicle in a good spot for this action to unfold. Let's try and see if this doesn't help. So he is still chasing it around. You can see his tail flicking about in the bush there. Still hear the squirrel not happy at all with the presence of this leopard in the area. Yeah, you know, Tex, it doesn't look like he's going to continue north anymore. So I don't know if you want to try and come back onto the southern side and get your limousine in here. <laughs> it's tricky for the other vehicles there. Yeah, possibly tax, but at this stage I don't think he's going to continue north anymore. So your only chance is going to be to try here or to toll another ingwe. <laughs> I'm just trying to give Tex his best an update as I can. It's his his call at the end of the day, but as I was saying, their vehicles are so much longer than ours and more difficult to maneuver that he may not be able to get his vehicle into this spot. But we will certainly try our best to get him here. And even if we have to make space, we've had such a great sighting of him already that we can now maybe give up our spot only temporarily just to let Texan and his guests 
take a closer look at this leopard and we must remember that if it wasn't for Aubrey who found this leopard we wouldn't be here right now so it's all about sharing out here It's interesting how I think through complete default every time this gerbil has run off it's come straight towards the vehicle making it impossible for Chandra to film. It sounds like the squirrel's getting a little bit tired and it'll be interesting if some of you have noticed how the call has changed over the time that it's from when it started till now. And that's important to remember if a squirrel is alarming like that you know that Whatever he has been alarming at has been here for quite some time. It's not the initial shrill excitement. Where has your gerbil gone, Cindy? There's such great training for him. Oh, interesting. Is that the luckiest gerbil on the planet? Or is it still... under siege from this leopard. I don't think he's going to give up quite that easily but there's some very thick bush here that the gerbil may have been able to disappear into. I'm surprised that it can even move after being clamped in the jaws of the leopard. But obviously it was just holding it very gently. And it's the distance and speed that the gerbil has been running off on each time it does get a moment indicates that it's still in surprisingly good health. Well, while Sindila is moving through this very thick bush, well, now let's keep on him. I've just seen the squirrel, but we'll get back to the squirrel later because we may get to see another surge of him chasing after this gerbil. to make his next maneuver. We can ask an interesting question through from Donna and good to have you with us Donna. Donna's interested to know if this leopard ever had any siblings and I'm almost certain he did have a brother or a sister at some point but I'm not sure how old either of the siblings may have been or any of the siblings may have been before they were killed in all likelihood by male leopard, hyena or lion. But it's common for leopard to give birth to two or three cubs. How many survive is usually low. But I'm almost certain that he would have at some point had siblings. And interestingly enough Donna, this is the first successful... Look at this! This is the first time that his mother's been successful at raising a cub to this age. Every other litter that she's had has not made it to adulthood. And I'm not sure how many litters she has had, maybe five or six at least. But this is the first one to make it to a decent age and in all likelihood he will make it to independence. Where has the gerbil gone, Sindile? Hiding under a fallen over log. And I think in a situation like this, he's going to be using his nose 
to try and help track down exactly where it is. He's straying further and further af afield now, so I think that this gerbil may have miraculously shaken it off, shaken the leopard off its tail. Now let's hope that as soon as Texan gets here that the leopard doesn't continue north, which it looks like it may be doing right now. Which will be to the area where Texan was patiently waiting for about 15 minutes. But we've got no control over the animals and they do exactly as they please. Sometimes making our lives a bit tricky. What have you found now? I think he's just in such a playful mood that any tiny little thing that rustles he pounces on. And aren't we, be, aren't we so lucky to be watching this incredible behavior? He's just a few meters away from us now. Actually at the initial point where he managed to latch on to this gerbil. So I'll Bumper was up against those dead leaves of a weeping wattle and that horizontal branch. So he's come back to the initial spot where he caught that prey. And he's digging around through a lot of the bark now, hoping he can find another one, but I don't think he's going to be so lucky, Madiba. Now what I would like to do is actually just try and we may have to make space for Texan and his guests to view the leopard. Oh, this is terrible timing. Tex, he's just on the other side of my vehicle. I'm going to try and go forward so you can get to see him. Oh, sorry everyone. I just wanted to rush out of the way there so that Texan can hopefully get a view of the leopard and Jandre may be able to get yeah, a glimpse of him but it's important that we get out of the best spots and allow Texan into it. You got him there Tex? having trouble with the radio. Did you get a view of him, Tex? Fan, he headed off straight through there, kind of north and east, through this Tambuti. He's just gone now as I move the... You've got him there. Well done. Okay, phew. Well, Texan and his tracker fanal have spotted him, so the guests are now all very happy and have got big smiles on their face. And we're just going to let them get into a good spot and then we will reposition the vehicle. Like I say, some of these people can come on safari for maybe two or three nights and imagine if they came and didn't get to see one leopard, it does happen. So I wanted to make sure we weren't the cause of that. And a lot of us, including you, are so spoiled with the sightings we get and the time we get to spend with these animals. 
and it's important wherever we can that we share. <coughs> okay, well, they have got into, or well, in the process of getting into the right spot, we now need to try and get out of this thick spot that we've got ourselves into. much Ellen for your report saying that young Madiba did have a sister so this leopard did have a sibling Donna and it was a female but Ellen's not too sure how old it was when it died or what actually caused that but still great to know that he did have a sister see a funny little spot up there as jean Dre zooms in he's got into a perfect position for Taxon and his guests to enjoy a view of him so that worked out well Well, can you believe it? That gerbil lives to tell the tale to its friends. And imagine being a prey item so small within the jaws of such a large predator and live to tell the tale. Absolutely incredible. And I'm fairly certain that after a few more moments or minutes of playing with that gerbil, he would have killed it and fed on it. But that was the risk he took. And I guess maybe he's not hugely hungry. He doesn't look like he's starving. And I guess that could be a contributing factor. If he was starving, he may have gobbled it up straight away. But don't be fooled that simply because it was small, that he wouldn't have been happy to feed on it. What I can do is just move the vehicle forward about a meter or so. And we should get a better view. Slightly better, there's still a few branches in the way. But I don't think this is going to be the end of his movements this morning. And I'm hoping after a short break and some time for grooming, which he's doing now, he'll hopefully get up and move one last time before it starts getting a bit too warm and I think it really is going to turn into a beautiful hot day. Oh, there you've got a good idea of the grooming that he's doing as he popped his one paw into the air. Always great to hear a new name having sent through a question. This one's from Washington 
and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I think it's Lael, and Lael would like to know, how do the big cats see? Do they see in black and white or color? And basically, Lael, a lot of the predators will have very limited color in their vision, and often just two tones, black and white, or different colors, but not great color view, uh, excuse me, I'm making a hash of this. They don't have great color vision, and the reason why they don't have good color vision is because their eyes are made up predominantly of rods, which are used for night vision, <coughs> and not cones. So even our eyes have rods and cones in them. We have many cones in our eye, and cones are responsible for the color we get to see and the wide spectrum of color that we can see. Predators who require nocturnal vision have not got enough space for a lot of these cones for color and their eyes will have many rods in them which help them pick up lights when it's very dark and that way be able to see their prey when hunting at night and that causes them to see in very very minimal shades of color and it basically is black and white you could say I've heard different theories that they see in a yellowy color but they don't have nearly as much of a color spectrum as we have a lot of the prey animals that they feed on will be more similar to us as humans and be able to see in different colors but also have a degree of night vision, not nearly as good as their predators, but I think certainly better than ours. Yeah, another bird alarm calling. I can't see it, and I'm not sure exactly what it is. You can just see it going. Where is it? But again, interesting how even small birds will alarm call at the leopards. We heard the squirrel earlier. The squirrel has stopped now, even though we are still in the same area. It's obviously carried on with its own business you may be able to hear one other animal still alerting anything in this area to the presence of this leopard. I discussed briefly my thoughts as to why <clears throat> he may have been willing to take the chance of playing with this gerbil and then run the risk of losing it. And Lisa Osborne would like us to let us know a little bit more of why it may have been doing that or whether it does that in order to learn and teach itself to continue to hunt. Or do we think now that it will learn its lesson from this specific moment where it lost its kill? Lisa, I think because he's not hugely hungry, he doesn't feel compelled to feed on this, or had he, what, he didn't feel compelled to feed on this gerbil. And therefore, yes, he did run the risk of losing it. I think the reason why he was playing with it was because it's fun. And... Yes, he's still young and we must remember that he's not an adult yet. And that playful nature of a youngster could have been coming through there. But even adult leopards may play with prey from time to time, especially prey that they are confident that is not going to escape like a baby impala. I've seen adult female leopards play with them before and relive the takedown. And the thrill for these predators of actually 
latching onto their prey must be quite something. And I guess once you, you have caught something that you are confident you can catch again, why not let it go to relive that excitement? So I'd put it down to purely his playful nature and the fact that he is not starving and could get by without that tiny little meal. I certainly don't think it's the first meal that he's caught and lost and it's probably happened many many times in his life so I don't think he's necessarily going to learn from this and I think the will to play and entertain himself will override the risk of losing the odd gerbil. Okay, let's try and reposition. He does seem to be quite comfortable in this spot, so we may be able to get you guys a better view. Not easy, and as we got you, he's flattened himself down. But what a great low angle this is. Beautiful. There we go. That's a bit better. Well, it looks like for the time being he may be comfortable in this spot, so I don't think we're going to lose him. And this may be a good opportunity to send you across to Brent and James who are continuing to search Juma for anything exciting so why don't you jump on board with them and see what's happening on the other side of Juma we're on the western side now they are on the east and they may have some interesting intelligence or updates for you and we'll be waiting here with Madiba when you get back Hello everybody, welcome back to uh, the Mahindra, our um, uh, South Asian member of our staff. Uh, doesn't have a name yet other than Mahindra. And this just gives you an impression of what we do when we're not on Jigger or Wendy. Uh, we drive about, we put somebody with good eyes on the front of the tracker seat, give everyone a wave, Brent. Yes, and his job is to look at the road and see if he can find some tracks. I am trying a new driving style as we speak, sitting upon the door. Um, if the screen goes black, it is because I've had a large-scale automotive accident. I'm not convinced about this particular driving style because I'm actually completely unable to reach the brake from where I'm sitting. A longer person may not have the same troubles. Um, what we did do while in, the, in your absence last time was go and try and have a look at a bush baby nest which Brent found the other day. There were no bush babies there within as far as we could tell um, and I also luckily didn't plummet to my death from the tree in which I was sitting. So our plan from here is to continue. We're now on the eastern boundary on the cheetah cut line uh, so named because there's never ever been a cheetah seen here or certainly I not by me. Cheetah, and Jamie sees a cheetah here. <laughs> okay. Okay, so there have been some cheetahs seen here, that is good news. And we are just hoping against hope that there will be some kind of track wandering across here. And I have, oh sorry, I'm also being reminded that I saw a cheetah here at one stage. <laughs> so please ignore everything I've said up to this point about cheetah. But we have been astonished by the lack of tracks crossing over the sort of freshly 
moistened roads over the last few days and I don't know where everything's gone. But I'm most pleased that Sundile Oslef, sorry, I'm not allowed to call him that anymore, Madiba, aka Nelson Mandela, has made his reappearance there in the southern reaches of Juma. Hopefully his mother and his grandmother will come back soon too. Now his grandmother has been conspicuous by her absence for the last little while. We think possibly because she's being pushed across to this particular area around here by shadow and by another leopard called Kwatile coming up from the south. And in Kanyanini from the east. And in Kanyanini from the east, according to Brent Leo Smith. Um, so lots of pressure from the various leopards and of course that's not uncommon for a female leopard for her territory to shrink uh, under pressure from her daughters and granddaughters. It's a little bit like the human being that has a farm and has to cut it in half for his sons. Um, that's actually exactly what it's like. Anyway, whether she'll reappear, reappear or not, we're not sure. But the other good news that I heard yesterday was that Mvula, a male leopard, my particular favorite, because he's not very large, a bit like me, and he was seen yesterday on a kill somewhere south of us, I think on Cheetah Plains, was it? Chitwa, Chitwa. On Cheetwa, Cheetwa. Yeah, directly south of uh, where we're going to join our southern boundary. Direct out the way we're going to join our southern boundary. Brent's microphone is not working, by the way, so if you can't, if he sounds like he is um, hailing you from a distance, it is because his microphone is not working. Sorry about that. So we're hoping maybe we'll pick his tracks up or any other tracks. Um, <laughs> And then some fascinating information just coming in from Safari Hayes that quarantine Mvula's son was seen with him the other day. Now that's wonderful to know. And we have lots of questions while we drive along about the skills of various mammals as fathers specifically. And normally we have to give people the disappointing news that the male of whatever species we happen to be looking at is a dreadful parent while the mothers are left to do all the work. And so it's very nice to hear that quarantine is being mentored by Ulla. <laughs> well, we hope he's being mentored and that they have been seen together. I must say, I think that's a, that's a very nice thing to hear and I'd love to see them together. So Safari Hayes, whoever gave you that information, perhaps you could ask them to send uh, Ulla and quarantine this way so that we might show them to you. Well, the only tracks are white mongoose heading south. And hyena. And now hyena. Keep your eyes open, Brent. Yes, sir. <laughs> the hyena tracks are moving over. So they're from yesterday. The white tail mongoose tracks are over. Mm. So I don't know if you can hear Brent. Uh, he's saying that there are lots of white tailed mongoose tracks going down the road. One or two hyena that have been driven over from yesterday. But nothing in the way of lions. We did hear the lions calling here yesterday. Brent and I are doing our sort of mock-up of the uh, sunset chat, if you like, next to the stinking carcass of an old buffalo. And we did hear lions calling far to the north and hoped that they would come south. But that doesn't appear to have been the case. And we've been listening to the Game Drive radio all morning and nobody has found sign of the lions in any of our traversing areas. Thank you, Marla, for your pointing out that this is truly the safari view from the vehicle. Yes, this is, this is basically, if you were on safari, this is what you would have. You would have some gimp like me um, blethering information at you, hopefully entertaining. And in the front of the vehicle, you would have the real bush person watching the tracks and keeping an eye out and spotting. Not so, Brent. That is very true, but he might be a few shades darker than I. Indeed. Normally, a Shangan tracker, because the Shangans have a massive tradition of excellent tracking in this area and especially when it comes to things like leopards and lions. Now on the subjects of leopards, let us head back to young Madiba, the first president of South Africa, uh, with Scott, who I believe is 
repositioned and we'll link back to him hopefully when you come back to us next we will have something slightly more impressive but a nice idea and very good to talk to you finally live again bye bye and see you just now Welcome back everyone and I'm sure you all enjoyed that different perspective and view of James and Brent cruising down Cheetah Cut Line. I look forward to having a peek at the highlights reel of the two of them in action. As you can see nothing has changed here. He's still in the same spot he is, poking his head up and down every so often. But I think it could be his resting point for the next couple of hours. I hope he proves me wrong and gets up and continues to move, but I think we have exhausted our luck with this young male leopard already this morning. And why don't you guys decide what we do next? You can send in your thoughts to whether we should stay or go to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And we're only going to take the first few votes, so be quick if you would like to have an impact or influence where we go next or whether we do leave or stay. I can tell you though, to help make your decisions, that there's not too much else going on in terms of tracks or potential sightings, but the only way to find these things is to get out and explore. So it's a bit of a gamble, heading off into the unknown, but you've got to gamble every now and then and take the risk. Texan's making his way out of the sighting, so that's what you can hear in the background. Look at that flawless face of his. No scratches or scars. And Clay has just asked whether or not this leopard, I think this leopard may have been in a fight and I think it's highly unlikely that he has been in a fight. We would be able to see some scars or scratches and he probably wouldn't be alive if he had been in a fight. Young leopards aren't going to fight with one another and if he did get caught out by a bigger leopard in a fight, it probably would have been the end of his career here. So I really don't think he's been in any serious confrontations. He would have certainly had to run for his life on a number of occasions. But I don't think he has been in a fight and his pure clean face, free of scratches and scars, even his ears don't have any notches in them yet, is a good indicator that he is still young and flawless but in the coming years he is going to certainly get into a few tussles with other leopards and that's when we'll start seeing the scratches on his muzzle as well as notches in his ears. Now leopards will have varying amounts of notches and scars depending on the individual and a lot of the notches on the ears are caused from possibly even mating when males and females lash out at one another after the copulation. It's a very painful process for both male and female. So things often get quite heated. So it can be a combination of mating scars and features.
So a lot of reports have come through of audio that's been heard on the various waterhole cams, one at Juma and one at Arethusa. And Wildy heard Leopard calling somewhere around Arethusa last night and would like to know how far does the sound of a leopard's rasp travel. It's a tricky one, Wildy, because it all depends on how sensitive the microphones are and receivers at the waterholes. And I, I'm told they are very good, but obviously it's very different to the human ear and maybe it can hear better than we could. But for me, especially at the moment with the vegetation being very dry and open, you can hear a leopard's call from about two to three kilometers away at the maximum. So about a third as far as you can hear lions calling. And that will depend on a number of variables, the terrain that it's in, whether it's undulating or very thick. And also what makes it complicated is I don't know exactly how well the audio is picked up by the microphones at the waterhole cameras, but I'm guessing, and this is just a guess, that it would have to be within a mile radius of the Watsall camera at a maximum for it to be able to pick up that audio. And in all likelihood, I would say even closer than that. So I would say less than a mile away would be a safe distance for the waterhole camera to pick up the leopard's rasp. And if you do go within a mile radius of the Arethusa Watsall, there are lots of hiding places, quite a few riverbeds, thick areas areas that are difficult to traverse and search for leopards but who knows maybe the guides there have got lucky and are enjoying a sighting of a leopard now there's no way of me being able to find out unless i drive onto arethusa and get closer to them so that i can be in radio comms with them i'm currently a little bit too far away to be able to communicate with them so sadly not sure whether they did have any luck finding tracks or maybe even the animal that you guys heard rasping. But thank you very much for those updates. So interesting, the voting has not led to a clear indication as to whether we should stay or whether we should go. So that makes it a little bit complicated for me because it puts the pressure on me to make this decision now. But let me try and rationalize what I think we should do with you. We have had a great, great sighting of him and At the moment he's fast asleep so i don't think we should stay any longer even though if we did stay longer who knows what we could see happen maybe his mother would come back and they would reunite i mean there's a never-ending list of things that could happen if we stay one of the things that could happen is he could get up and move straight into this thick bush and we could not see him again so that's one of the negatives but I think the fact that we have already had such a wonderful morning with them and the fact that there are so, so many other animals and scenery to see along the way, that I think we should continue. So I'm sorry if that wasn't your vote. And I, I completely understand and could very easily be on the stay here boat. But maybe we could come back later and see if he's still around. I think the temperature is also going to play a big impact on what he gets up to and as it gets hotter and warmer he's going to be less likely to be active. So maybe we can just take one last look at him and for a few moments and then I think we head off and see what else is happening. But I mean, you can look at that body language and tell that he is very comfortable. Hard to even tell that he's there. And 
I think that is our cue to venture forth into the unknown. Thank you, Mr. Madiba. And thank you to Aubrey who found him this morning. Because if it wasn't with Aubrey, or if it wasn't for Aubrey, we would have had nothing to see here. Just going to try and negotiate our way out of this thick Tambuti cluster, which may take a number of short and sharp turns. I'm making a meal of this. It looks like we are stuck for the time being. And Lisa's just made a comment that he's so comfortable with the vehicles and you rightly see he's incredibly relaxed around the vehicles and that's probably because we've spent many an hour sitting with him reassuring him that we are not here to cause him any harm and they he's at the point now where he doesn't even lift up his head or bat an eyelid when we arrive pushing over branches and bushes he's completely comfortable with our presence and sometimes I wonder to myself when he is, especially when he's left alone, if he doesn't actually appreciate our present because it's a little bit of company. I'm certainly not saying that he is attached to us, but I think a little part of him every now and then is happy to see us when he's left alone. Some spectators to watch him showing off, like this morning, catching his prey. He kept looking up at us Almost waiting for a round of applause. choose the easiest way out of here. just got a request as we move out of the leopard sighting and it's from Liz in Wisconsin and she's wanting us to find her any signs of spring so I'll certainly be keeping an eye out for anything blossoming or blooming some signs of spring there's some interesting bulbs that I've noticed and we think it's some kind of a squill which is basically a bulb and you get many different types of squills that shoots up these beautiful flowers of various sizes. And it's often just one stalk blooming with flowers. And I've noticed one type, James and I found it while we were on tracking team the other day. And I know where there is one hiding, so that is gonna be one of the signs of spring. And I'm sure James and Brent will also be able to, or in a good position, to try and get you up close to any different signs of spring because they do have the ability to jump on and off the vehicle and often the tiny little shoots of spring and signs of spring will be best shown from a close proximity and they can get to those nice close angles and low angles with the walking backpack. The squirrel comes to mind as an initial thing to look for. The one
ones we actually saw were all the way up on Cheetah Cut Line, which is where you were driving with James and Brent earlier. But there's a few more that I've seen popping up closer to the quarantine clearing. So I'll certainly be able to show you one towards the end of the drive if we don't find anything else interesting before then. now is to slowly head back up in the direction where we actually came from and that's the direction that I think this leopard's mother that we just left was moving and hunting in and maybe we'll get to see her on the hunts imagine if we see him early on in the morning with a gerbil kill well a gerbil kill kind of a gerbil catch that he sadly lost well sadly for himself it's very Good news for that little gerbil but imagine if we get to see his mother also hunting a little bit later on that'll be incredible to see mother and cub catch something on the same day will be something that i'm sure hasn't been documented or captured before Awesome this is. I mean, the bush was so, so dry just a few days ago. And not only dry, it was also very hazy. So I'm going to start off by showing you how the moisture levels have changed drastically. And this small little pond would have been naturally created by animals who wallow in the mud. Animals like warthog, elephants, rhino, all love to bathe themselves in these small wallows and that naturally excavates them and it also creates a natural little puddle and it's something we can look forward to seeing in the hotter months of the year even hyena will lie up in small puddles like that to keep cool now another thing i would like to show you that you probably haven't seen for some time is a view off to the mountain range in the distance it's still a little bit hazy but it will continue to become clearer and clearer as we get more rain. And John, if you don't mind panning to the left, there's a small little range of mountains that I would like to show everybody. It's still actually within the Sabi Sands. It'll give you an idea of how far the Sabi Sands stretches from where we are still further, Jean Andre. There they are. So those little mountain ranges are in the same reserve that we are in. And there's a fence basically on the other side of them. And there's a lodge on one of those rocky copies called Ulusaba, the place of fear. Beautiful. so so clean at the moment it's hard to describe you just you can't breathe in enough of it and maybe it's just after all the dry and dusty months we've experienced that I'm not used to it but it really does feel like we are breathing in the cleanest freshest air on the planet it's almost got a taste of freshness to it 
and the temperature at the moment is also very very nice it's not too hot there's a cool breeze blowing and in the next few weeks we're going to see a massive change even in the next few days in greenery and growth around this area there's not too much evidence at the moment but the amount of rain that we got a few days ago is certainly going to be enough to cause a surge of green and the sunny weather that we're experiencing today may help the plants to really boost out their new shoots and new growth. Now, this is my earpiece causing trouble again. Shouldn't be. may be wondering why a lodge would be called Place of Fear and you'll have to ask Richard Branson that, that because he owns that lodge and maybe it just sounds dramatic and dangerous of being on the dark continent which is Africa. I'm not too sure though but that is just the name of that specific lodge. And it's one of many, many lodges within the Sabi Sands. There are probably in excess of 20 lodges in the whole of the Sabi Sands, some of which are small and only cater for a few guests, others may be much larger. And there's a huge variance in prices of the camps you stay at and experiences that you will get at each camp, even though you are in the same place with the likelihood of seeing very similar sightings or animals. The experience will naturally be very different between each lodge. They cater for different niches of clientele. And it's very it's worth doing a lot of research before you come out to any camp in Africa or the Sabi Sands. Because there is a multitude of different options and it's best to try and really work out which is going to be the best for you before you rush out here. Tiny shoots growing on a silver cluster leaf tree. Let's take a closer look for some signs of spring. I mean, it's it's ever, ever, ever so slightly. If I am even actually seeing the right thing, let me just get my binoculars out. There's a few tiny little white tips. Oh no, those are old news. Those are the old dried out white buds. So still no sign of growth coming out of this silver cluster leaf. These little white tips got me excited. But we must keep watching closely because like I say, after all that rainfall that we did receive, it's not going to be long before we see the trees responding with some vigorous growth. Barbara and good to have you on board with us. Barbara's interested to know the differences in the seasons that we experience out here. And unlike some 
countries and places and cities, we don't have four very distinct and clear seasons. And it's basically summer and winter, really. Um, almost split up into equal six-month portions. The spring and the autumn aren't necessarily as clear and well noticed or noticeable as they are in other parts of the world. And what we'll notice now as we are in our spring, but essentially summer, we'll just notice a continual increase in growth and vegetation as the rainy season is in our summer months. So the rain gives the plants all the water they need to grow and the sun and the heat allow them also to grow very well. And that will be up until about February or March next year. So October, November, December, January, February, March. And then it starts drying up for the other six months of the year, which is our winter. Now colder and drier months. that I have seen oh there we go there's one that I have seen sprouting oh, there's one a bit closer to the road that we can get it's called the Bushman's grape and here's some right here this has been one of the earlier bloomers out of most of the vegetation and you'll be able to see here the tiny little shoots and growths coming out but most of the plants aren't quite ready yet and this plant next door is certainly alive but it has not started shooting up the precious nutrients and resources that it's been saving in its roots mainly during the winter it's going to wait now and in the next few weeks it's going to invest them up into the leaves and branches of the tree as will a lot of the trees around us here some of them still have a few leaves that survived the winter miraculously but the majority of the trees have been plucked by the animals or the leaves have simply fallen off but that will change and where i'm standing now and you can see me in a few weeks time you won't be able to see me if i'd be standing here this is going to be completely thick and overcrowded with leaves and our job of finding animals is going to become trickier. But like I said earlier, I think one of my theories as to why we still manage to find animals in the very thick conditions in the summer is that they may stick to the roads more often and stick to the open areas. And that kind of makes sense because just like us, animals try and take the path of least resistance. In winter, you can walk around anywhere, be it even we can, the animals can, without getting snagged up and caught on things. But in summer, when everything's thick, you can't even see where you're standing because the grass is so long, it becomes a different story. So that's why I think we still manage to find animals in the, in the summer. Well, I'm sure a lot of you must be wondering what James and Brent are up to. And there's only one way to find out, and that's to head on across to them. So enjoy, and I wish I was coming along to see what they are doing as well. And we'll see you a little bit later. Hey everybody, welcome back to this magnificent tree, Kosia Brachilla, or the Weeping Bean. Now, what is interesting about this tree, well, there are a number of interesting things about it. But first, and my colleague Brian Smith and I don't understand the concept of this, of course, but apparently bark can be used to cure a hover. Okay, I mean, I don't know if you have a so I wouldn't know that that is true or not. Yes. Uh, Sorry about the audio, apparently it is breaking up slightly. Um, oh, breaking up. Is this 
thing here called a bracket fungus. And the bracket fungus likes to grow in moist, wet areas at the base of these trees, and also on trees that have a fairly soft heartwood, in, or a wood that is eaten out by things such as borer beetles. Yes, indeed, the bracket fungus is not edible, fairly disgusting, and apparently we've had a question about land snails. Welcome back everyone. And this long-tailed shark has just made a kill. It's got a scorpion. Look at this. Incredible. It's difficult to see very clearly, but you can see the sting of the scorpion hanging down. You can also see the pincers. I can't tell what kind of scorpion it is. It's a bit too far away. And look, it's going for the sting now. It's trying to get rid of the dangerous end. Oh, poor scorpion. Lucky bird though. Tasty breakfast. Swallowed. Job done. Just like that. He swallowed the whole scorpion hole. Imagine having a scorpion wriggling around in your belly. Well, that's what this long-tailed shrike is experiencing at the moment. And it looked like I got a kind of good enough glimpse to, to say that I think it's a hairy, uh, not a hairy thick-tailed scorpion. A lot of the common, well, a lot of the scorpions don't actually have common names, but that one didn't look highly venomous. It had quite big pincers, and it looked like an Epistothalmus glabifrons which is the same scorpion that VM spotted just the other day. And it's just making sure its beak is nice and clean. And that scorpion that we did spot the other day, or VM spotted it, was on the ground. And they do move around. And maybe the shrike got lucky and saw the scorpion doing some housekeeping around its excavation or burrow. This specific scorpion that it just ate lives in burrows in the sand. A lot of the other scorpions will live in the cracks of the bark and trees. And not our first scorpion that we've seen being eaten recently. Not long ago when we were testing out a night camera, we got to see the white-tailed mongoose eats a scorpion. Well, glad we managed to rush you back from James and Brent just in time. And I'm sure you enjoyed the <coughs> Brief change of scenery. Still fine tuning that equipment and trying to get it working as well as we can. Still experiencing some audio issues, which I thought you, uh, I think you guys got a, a, a little taster of there. But isn't it fun to just be able to show you guys a different perspective and a few different angles on this experience, even if the audio isn't perfect. I'm certainly not going to settle for that, but for now, I think it's great that you can be involved in this whole process and then we'll all really be able to appreciate the equipment when it is working 100%, which hopefully won't take our tech wizards too much longer to work out. Well, a morning of carnage and destruction, some delay with the uh, Gerbil kill, well, I mean that one got away, the scorpion wasn't so lucky, but not often that we get to see so many kills or action taking place like that. Molly on Twitter, good to have you with us and Molly would like to know whether we have the olive frog out here and not that I know of but I do need to go through the frog book now that it's frog season again and refresh my rusty memory. 
But it doesn't ring a bell. There is a host of different frogs and toads that we will get to show you over the coming months. And not only that, Molly, but the chameleons that you asked after are also going to be starting to move around now and they're going to become a lot easier for us to see and the best time and most likely time for us to spot them is actually at night with the spotlights during the day i'm trying to think of a good way to explain this to you i think there's an option here or an opportunity to here basically during the day if a chameleon was in a bush like this behind me it would blend in very, very well with the colors using its camouflage abilities and the abilities to be able to alter its colors depending on the substrate that it's on. So if it was in this bush, it would be green. If it crossed the road, they go a yellow color. So they can't always match the exact background of where they are. Some chameleons can, but the flat neck can't quite do it exactly right. But they will be able to change from a green color to a yellow color as they cross the road. But during the day, it's very, very difficult to see them unless they are crossing a road. And even then, a lot of people don't see them and squish them. But during, at night time with the spotlight, what you'd be looking for is something like the color of this one leaf here. So this one leaf is just a slightly paler shade to the rest of this bush. And when you're looking for scorpions, at, uh, chameleons at night with the spotlight, you are looking for a slightly lighter shade so it's essentially a dead leaf with the shape of a chameleon and the chameleons if you're looking at a side profile have got a very distinct pose and posture with their head and body and their tails all curled up like a sausage like a swiss roll so if you get that side profile of a dead leaf coloration the shape of a chameleon you know you're in luck and it's something that often astonishes guests when they are out here on safari and you can be driving very quickly and spot the tiniest of little chameleons they will be hatchlings this big soon and they'll also be much larger ones the adults that we get to see so we'll be able to show you a host of different sizes but all the same species all the flapped neck chameleon here but you can imagine driving along in the dark all of a sudden your guide jams on brakes reverses and reveals this tiny chameleon and people cannot understand how on earth you've seen them but it's actually quite easy and guides get a lot of un undue credit for spotting a chameleon and the hard work that the track end guide have done tracking and finding a leopard can often be kind of seen as the norm but your spotting of the chameleon is the highlights of your guest stay which is actually quite frustrating because it requires no skill well not no skill but not as much skill as tracking down a leopard anyway that's just some interesting kind of behind the scenes of what us guides get up to and you naturally ride the wave and act like you are the greatest thing on earth for spotting whatever you have the greatest eyes on earth for spotting this chameleon and you don't necessarily tell them how easy it is but i guess that depends on the guide and depends on the specific set of guests enjoying the fact that a lot of you are showing a keen interest on a lot of the smaller critters that we have seen and are going to see and Spusisu aka the black mamba in Hermann's Kral, so it's one of our South African viewers would well he's pointed out that scorpions and snakes are venomous you are 100% correct Spusisu where you've gone wrong is that you've then said they are therefore poisonous and then how can that bird that we've just seen eat a scorpion without becoming intoxicated and the reason is in the words that you've used venom 
has to be injected into your bloodstream and that's why you use the word venomous for things that can sting you and that can bite you and you were, use the word poisonous for things that you can ingest so poison needs to be eaten in order for it to affect you you can pour poison over your skin and nothing will necessarily happen it, it does depend but basically poison needs to be swallowed venom needs to be injected and that's why that long-tailed shrike could feed on the scorpions sting and all without worrying about having any negative effects and it's the same for the snake eagles or any of the birds of prey or animals that eat snakes you can even drink the venom of snakes provided you've got no abrasions or cuts in your mouth it shouldn't and won't have any effect on you so that I'm sure is not only cleared it up for you Spusiso but for a lot of people they often get venom and poison confused and use the words synonymously I don't know if that's 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 the correct word to use but they are certainly not synonyms they're two very different things now we are approaching the small squill that's a plant that grows from a bulb and it shoots up an arm with flowers or a branch with flowers coming out of it and you get lots of different types of squills the one squill that we'll get to see is the tall white squill this one is a cousin that we haven't been able to identify exactly which one it is but as part of our research we actually dug one of them up whilst we were on tracking team James and myself we were tracking a leopard and got distracted and then all of a sudden we were sitting down digging like little children with sticks and so we managed to excavate a bulb about the size of an apple and it's going to be quite nice to show you what is above the ground now that we know what is below now where is this little squirrel there's one here somewhere it's right at the entrance to some of the accommodation where half of our crew stay the other half stay not too far away here it is so I'm just gonna jump out This is a certain sign of spring we've only noticed them popping up very recently and isn't it interesting how this shoot comes up from like I said quite a large bulb that's probably about six inches under the ground and out from that bulb pops this pretty little stalk sadly the flowers aren't open at the moment but all of these little buds will open up into little flowers and we'll be able to show you more of them there's quite a few around various parts of the reserve but also a very clear sign of the springtime I just heard Craig trying to get a hold of me earlier he probably wants an update as to where we left Madiba so I'm just going to be giving him a quick chat an update Craig for Scott. No negative, I left about 25 minutes ago. Um, if you drive along Gowrie Main towards the signboards, you'll see my vehicle tracks coming off road, probably about 50 meters east of the signboards. And then if you just follow them back in, it was lying up on a prominent termite mound in a Tamburti thicket. The visual was, was pretty good if he's in the same place, but tricky to get in there. Oh, quickly, Jandre, there's some Impala shooting across. It's a bit of a gamble, but always nice to show you the animals jumping for joy. And at least we got a glimpse of those Impala shooting off. Oh, here comes some more, Jandre. And I'm telling you, this is the weather 
and the fact that these impala know life is good, the green grass is on the way. And I certainly would also be celebrating if I was an impala. We did go past a herd earlier that were literally pronking and jumping and you can imagine being a herbivore and only having this very dry grass to feed on. For months on it, it's been an incredibly dry season, drier than normal. There goes Eugene, our tech wizard. Morning, Eugenie. And he's such a wonderful man. We're so lucky to have him around. He doesn't like being in front of the camera, so he's going to remain anonymous for a lot of you, but we'll try and sneak the odd picture of him that we'll add onto the tweets. But he is a pivotal member of our team who just because you don't get to see him or hear him speak very often or hear his name necessarily, that's not to say that he is not a wonderful member of our team. And the amount of problems that he has to solve on a daily basis is astonishing. And very often he'll just be at the verge of finishing one problem and then somebody will appear out of the shadows and tap him on the shoulder and say, Eugene, when you finished here, we've got another problem for you to come and solve. Jandre spotted a troop of vervet monkeys up ahead, so let's see if we can catch up to them. They're an animal we don't get to show you very often. And they're running past our old fireside chat spots. It's just up to the left here. It's not an old fireside chat spot, it is the fireside chat spot. And let's see if we can get you a view of these monkeys. Now interestingly they're trying to hide from us, but there's some here and some in this marula tree, so I'm going to leave it up to Jandre. Okay, we're going to cut to James, we're going to crash cut to James quickly. Hello everybody, we're back with uh, the Mahindra and we're looking at some Drongo. I think I have everything it looks to me. Uh, they may of course be involved in that other likely violent activity, the mating. But I'm not really sure. Brent, what do you think they're doing? I think they're definitely the one that really got its up and it's almost the when I was looking through the lens there, it looked like it grabbed um, the other's tongue almost and, and had its beak inside the beak. Um, you guys, we can't see what the camera is seeing, but it is very much around the face of the stronger that's on the ground. This looks to be a very serious fight. Yes, it certainly does. It looks positively vicious. Uh, not quite like WWE fighting. This is very genuine violence taking place in front of us. And I suspect it's because we're heading towards spring, well, we're in the spring now, and obviously the competition for territory, female, is going to be that much heavier. But, I mean, this looks like it could result in death almost. Now, the one on the bottom yeah. does look like he's, he's running out of a bit of steam. Mm. And the guy on top doesn't look like he's about to let up either. Yeah. It is quite disturbing I must say it's not um well, one doesn't like to see too much violence especially from birds which I suppose we tend to think of as uh, sweet song songsters of the morning rather than vicious killers of them see in on this check with your just see if there's any kind of blood damage but I can see it's, it's, the one on top has literally almost got it by the throat. Not. Not. Sorry about the audio. Oh, there I can see it now. Can you? Looks like it's hold. That drums are really move. Right, I have my power 
killers are used by a few martial Irwin while doing desert campaign. That's difficult. I think I didn't know that. Completely. It seems to be struggle. It seems to be getting even weaker. She very does. A bit of fat in him, but very little. They're turn the little slightly. I can't see the color so similar that you can really see where one starts and ends. There we go. Oh, Get away. Oh, no, no, from top. I'm able to punch in on the feet there. Yeah. So everybody, if the picture is the stable, it's because there's fairly Gale blowing, and second, we set this up very far, so it's not vehement holding it. Clearly, he does have the hands of a surgeon. This is vicious. Almost sound to stress car sort of a given mm. No, if I was a little gabar golf or a sparrow or something like that, I would come and chameleon of these drongos. Definitely, I think it's bigger. Maybe a bit bigger. Oh. Mm. Probably. It... Oh. Oh, it's over. Gone. No, no. Here we go. Shame they just won't let each other be. Well, I'm quite glad that that's ended. I must say that's quite a uh, distressing to watch. It's, um, vice, of course, is a way of life. And <laughs> we're just trying a new thing with the microphone. And I'm now, I feel like I'm a reporter coming to you live from Beirut uh, during the uh, conflict there and where we have just watched the violence, of course, the um, drongos as the humans fighting with each other there in Lebanon at that time. Hello. Hello, James. 
will they fight to the death, do you think? This is a question from Anna Marie Brent. Well, I think uh, given the opportunity, they would. And I actually thought it might be a death this, this morning. But fortunately for the smaller team, Drongo, that was on the it, to escape, uh, I thought those losers towards the end started sounding like submiss submissive noises. It changed from that to sort of a like it sounded like a, a, a dismissive call rather than that initial aggressive call that we were in. Lots of comment Twitter, um, missing a couple of names, our comms are a little bit difficult today. But um, you said it looked as if the larger one on for the throat, absolutely it looked like they'd gone for the throat. And then it looked like they were going for various parts of the body as well. Uh, we had the throat, they were attacking the, the beak, so just... I think it looked to me like the sub there probably a territorial dispute. Have a look at Brent's camera here. There we've got a, a shot of them beak to beak. But fascinating. Right, <laughs> But fa fascinating, I've never seen a Drongo fight go and on that long and with that yeah. much aggression. Brent will post this on Twitter and hashtag Safari Live because Brent is a very good tweeter. Um, and, I mean, you do see Drongos quite a lot. I mean, they fight, they bomb other birds quite a lot. They bomb all the eagles, they bomb owls, pearl spotted owls, and probably they clearly not bomb each other. A very, very aggressive little bird. But I mean, that was an unbelievably fascinating interlude. And definitely not something James and I have seen before in our past years in the bush. Yes. So, and on that note, we're going to send you back across to Scotty. And hopefully, before the end of drive, we might be able to find some something else interesting. Something perhaps a little less violent. See you just now. Some cuddled, cuddly bears. Like this microphone. Welcome back everyone and what an interesting sighting you've all been lucky enough to share with James and Brent and Viem. It sounds like quite a hardcore fight between those drongos and isn't it wonderful how we often get surprised out here getting to share new experiences and moments with all of you. As you can see, Jandre and myself have not moved from the place where you left left us and these three vervet monkeys are enjoying the vantage point from their perch high up in a jackalberry tree oh, what am I saying a jackalberry tree apologies an apple leaf tree and it looks like they're also enjoying not only the view from up there as they scan their heads around but also the morning sunshine you can tell that it's quite breezy and it's a cool breeze some leftover effects from the cold front that brought us that much needed rain a few days ago great well we're gonna leave these monkeys to their own devices and I'm going to actually take you to a spot where we had one of our best sightings of a black mamba which is probably the most venomous and dangerous snake we encounter out here in the Sabi sands its venom is highly neurotoxic so it attacks your nervous system and basically your organs will shut down causing you to die the good news is if you do have a good first aider around they, as long as oxygen is kept pumped through your body you can be revived with life support systems so if you are bitten by a black mamba just tell people to keep the oxygen pumping through your body and that way you can stay alive and the way that people would do that is through CPR so that would be the best way to keep somebody alive if they are bitten by a black mamba 
and the sighting that unfolded was in this big marina tree to our left. And I'm just going to park a bit the vehicle in a good spot where I can explain exactly how the sighting unfolded. We did have a few other sightings of black mamba, probably the same one in this clearing or the same pair. They are territorial snakes. And I'm just going to stop here and talk you through what happened. So basically, what happened was, is it was myself and Romeo or Jason, one of the other cameramen who is studying at university now, we heard some Birchall starlings alarm calling and they were alarm calling in this tree. I'm just going to go around you now. So they were up in this small jackalberry tree and they were alarm calling and looking down into this area. Now, it was in the summer months, early uh, last, uh, or early this year, and at that stage there was a carpet of green vegetation about this high. So not very high at all, and for me, I would have thought you'd be able to see a snake slithering through, at least the movements of the snake slither slithering through this short layer of green undergrowth, only about four inches high. And we got a glimpse of the snake initially, and it was somewhere around here. And as I was searching in this area, and Jason was zoomed in on this area where we last saw the snake, I was standing on the bonnets of the vehicle, looking down. We couldn't see anything there. And then out the corner of our eye, we noticed that the snake had moved to here. And we sadly didn't get to film it, but the Birchall starling was actually flying above the snake. And out of the corner of the eye, we saw the snake shoot up out of the grass and strike at the Birchall starling, which was flying above it. And then that helped us detect exactly where it was. And from here, we followed the snake. It slithered up into this tree. And then if you go further up this tree, it slithered into this hole. And that was the last glimpse we got of it. I hope it's not in here now, but this is where the black mamba went. Oh. I'm not sure where my earpiece went. Oh, here it is. <coughs> so, that was an interesting sighting we had of one of the most dangerous snakes we get in this area. Hopefully we'll be able to get to show you a few more in these summer months. And who knows, maybe it will be in that same very hole that I was just poking my finger into. Okay. Last station, go again, please. And Anna Marie has just asked a wonderful question. She's interested to know if a snake eagle is big enough to handle a black mamba. And yes, most certainly. I wouldn't say a fully grown big black mamba because they can be three meters in length and about this thick. So that's going to be too big for a brown snake eagle or its cousin, the black chested snake eagle, which we do see here from time to time. Uh, snake eagles prefer snakes. Uh Anywhere up to about six feet in length, I would say, would be the absolute maximum size for the snake eagles. Anything bigger than that, they wouldn't be able to swallow, and they swallow the snakes whole, head first. 
And once I uh, had an incredible sighting, we came across this brown snake eagle and it had caught a boom slung, which is also a highly venomous snake. Thankfully, thankfully for us as humans, they don't pose too much of a risk because they are back fanged. So they would battle to bite onto you and they almost have to chew their prey to get the venom in. Anyway, a highly venomous snake, the boom slung or tree snake which the name directly translates from Afrikaans or Dutch into English. Boom meaning tree and slung meaning sl snake. Anyway, this brown snake eagle was finishing off a male boom slung. The males have got a bright green coloration and I could only see about this much of the tail sticking out of the brown snake eagle's mouth. And it just had, I mean you could imagine it probably had probably three or four feet of snake in its stomach and just about six inches remaining to swallow. And the snake wrapped its tail over the brown snake eagle's head and then down underneath its chin or its beak and latched that final part of its tail so it went out the left hand side of its beak straight over the head and then latched on and the snake eagle could not get this tiny little bit of tail untangled over its head but eventually it somehow managed to get that last bit in and swallow it but it took it quite some time and imagine how uncomfortable it must be having that long line of snake all the way into your stomach with the last little bit like a piece of spaghetti tied around your head that you can't undo or, or swallow another snake eating bird which we will hopefully get to see there's not too many of them is the secretary bird it's such an interesting bird I must actually get it out in the book and show you um, where am I gonna find you there we go and Monica and Liz Happy to hear you were one step ahead and asking already if we do see secretary birds and we do. Arethusa airstrips the best place to see them. I've had quite a few sightings there and it's the bird on the bottom right here. It's got very long legs and this beautiful tuft of feathers that come off its head and that's how they get their name because it's like a secretary with lots of pens sticking out of her hair. Now. I haven't seen too many secretaries with a multitude of pens sticking out of their hair, but that's why it got its name. And with those incredibly long legs, what it does is it walks along, so it hunts by walking. It can fly from A to B, of course, but it walks through big open clearings and it can hammer those feet down at incredible speed and precision to wallop the snakes on the head. So they do feed predominantly on snakes, but I've also seen them with the dwarf mongoose school, so they will feed on small rodents, lizards, rats, insects, but they are snake hunting specialists and have got this incredible ability to, with extreme accuracy and speed, unleash those long legs and stamp down onto snakes' heads. That's another snake-eating raptor. But a lot of the eagles, even if they aren't specialist snake hunters like the snake eagles, they will also feed on snakes. Owls I've seen with snakes, spotted eagle owls, verose eagle owls. So the snakes are on the menu. Dangerous cuisine, but still fed on by a multitude of different birds as well as mammals. Haven't heard you before sending through any questions, so good to have you with us. And Blaine is interested to know how many young could a black mamba have? And I'm guessing somewhere between 15 and 30. It's a complete guess off the top of my head. And if any of you do know the answer to the likely amount of young a black mamba will have please let us know
topic of the legendary black mamba that so many people have heard about but don't know the finer details of it now Spusisu who is also known as the black mamba one of our viewers that's his nickname is interested to know is it true that black mambas are one of the only snakes who will attack humans even if they are not provoked and it depends on who you speak to Spusisu but you're speaking to me right now and I will tell you categorically that unless you provoke a snake it is not going to actively seek you out and attack you now we need to be careful here because if you walk into a little bathroom and there's a black mamba within that little bathroom even though you are not provoking it naturally you are very big it is smaller than you and it's in a confined area so it feels threatened it's got nowhere to go there's four walls all around it i think it's justified and rightfully so it will attack you because it feels threatened but i don't think that they will if we are walking through the bush like this see us and slither up to us and bite us they will more likely do the opposite and try and slither away and escape we're much bigger than them we're certainly not going to be prey to them so why would they take the risk unnecessarily of getting into a confrontation with an animal that is so much bigger than it that's not to say Spusisu that they are very aggressive and they aren't scared of us as some snakes would be even if confined they know that they are highly venomous and they back themselves but I don't think they are actively ever going to seek us out or bite us unless we do put them into a bit of a predicament come on now we just need to see a black mamba that would be great wouldn't it touched on the fact that not only birds will feed on snakes but also some of the mammals and Anna Marie would like to know what kind of snakes would dwarf mongooses feed on well small ones would be my immediate answer to that and they can't be very fussy and a lot of the animals in this area will not know the difference between a black mamba and a boom slung and a house snake they will see a snake and know that it is potentially dangerous to them and do their utmost to not get bitten whilst trying to kill it now for a small animal like a dwarf mongoose that will often be preyed on by snakes bigger snakes pythons an adult black mamba will equally be able to feed on and catch and kill baby pythons and baby black mambas so even the same snake species that can kill them can be fed on by them when they are young and small so because the dwarf mongooses are so small Anna Marie they are typically going to be attacking any snake as long as it's not big hot so I'm gonna take off my jersey another snake that I'd really love to show you and have actually probably had the best snake sighting of was of a puff adder and it's a short and fat snake quite sluggish with beautiful beautiful cryptically camouflaged markings also seriously venomous but unlike the black mamba whose toxin is neurotoxic venom is neurotoxic the black mamba is cytotoxic and your flesh will rot away wherever it bites it often causes amputations if you are bitten by one of them
right, Carol, thank you very, very much. Pretty nightmare for confirming how many young or eggs a black mamba will lay. And I wasn't too far off. I said 15 to 30, according to Pretty Nightmare. It is between 15 and 25. So thank you so much for sh researching that and sharing that with us. Sadly, it seems like the Sunrise Safari is coming to a close. What a great morning it's been. It's been wonderful to have you all along with us. And we must remember our gratitude and appreciation that we owe to Aubrey, who managed to find Madiba, that beautiful male leopard who we got to spend some great, great quality time with. And I'm sure a lot of you were happy to be involved in the first live kill, even though it wasn't a kill. I suppose that's almost the ideal. We get to see the action, but nobody gets hurt. And that little gerbil managed to run off to tell its friends the tale of what it's like to be in a leopard's jaws. An unlikely scenario, but what a great sighting it was and happy to spend some time with him. I certainly hadn't spent too long with him for quite a while now and it was good to get to see him again. Also great that James and Brent were out with Viem on the walking backpack. I'm sure you enjoyed the moment spent with them and especially that sighting of the forktail drongos having a real battle. Really interesting and I look forward to watching those highlights. It's not something that we get to show you very often. So it sounds like my earpiece has popped out again. And anyway, we are gonna call it quits. My earpiece wasn't working so I wasn't getting any signal from the directors saying that it is the end of the show anyway thanks again thanks to nikki and tara in the final control room and to jandre on camera we will see you all on the sunset safari